to confess something. That, um, I'm not going to preach the sermon like I normally do. Um, because it is something that came over me. Um, and that is that, you know, I love this church. And when I pray for people in this church and I feel the pain of some of you, I feel the sorrow of some of you, I feel the agony of some of you. Sometimes when you're up here, it's a little difficult to just state the facts and move on. Because I too am going through something. I did not share during the prayer time, but my mother was taken to the hospital on Friday. Okay, she's running tests today. She's in, uh, in her 80s. So um, they're not sure what is wrong. I still to this moment have not gotten a report yet. Uh, hopefully I will sometime today. So please pray for my mother. But I understand also that when it comes to the sanctuary, it is really important that we understand the doctrines of our faith as it relates to the sanctuary. So what I thought I'd do is I'd tell you a small little story. When I was in school, uh, uh, in college for theology, I had an instructor. His name was uh, Bill Brzezanski. I can't say his last name, forgive me. And he was the type of man who was a very humble man. He was the most humble man I've ever met. He was the type of person that was a scholar when it comes to the Bible. I mean, he would give you facts that it is amazing how knowledgeable he was about the Bible. But he was also a man who, to me, could almost speak to anyone. I've seen him in a room with everyone from PhDs to doctorates, and he would relate to them. And I've seen him in the neighborhoods with some young children in the hood, and they liked him. They re he related to them. He was the kind of person who could speak to, it seemed to me, almost anyone. And spiritually, he had an anointing because he's the only man I've ever seen that laid hands on someone and they were healed immediately. I had never experienced that before. So I had a great deal of respect for this man. One day he was given a lecture. And he walked out into the audience where I was sitting. And he removed his shoes. And he gave it to me. And, he's, and I thought, well, my goodness. He gave me his shoes. He said, one day, you're going to walk in your shoes. This was, to me, a shock. You know, I said, how can I walk in his shoes? This man has been all over the world. This man has spoke to, he spoke to Congress before. And I said, how can I do that? But I remember about him. He's, he's passed away now, I think six, seven years now, he's passed away. But I remember how I felt when I was in his presence. A man with that much wisdom, with that much humility. And it just gave me a, a sense that, well, if I can just project or project just a little bit of that, then I can help somebody see the love of God. And I said, well, if I can do that, then I think that I can help somebody. And so when I look back on him, and I think, well, to begin with, this is the purpose of the sanctuary. To be in the presence of God. To have his anointing over us so that we can reflect his character in everything that we do, in every thought that we have, in our response one to the other. The Bible says there are two great commandments. Love thy God with all thy heart, soul, and mind. And love thy neighbor as thyself. On these two commandments and all the laws and the prophets. Amen. So when you look in your Bibles, and we look at Exodus chapter number 25. And what I'm going to do in my story is I'm going to talk a little bit about the tabernacle. The sanctuary. What really was the purpose of the sanctuary? To begin with, let's understand something. The sanctuary on earth was a replica of the 
the sanctuary in heaven. What happened to the sanctuary in heaven? What happened to Lucifer when he was in heaven and the sanctuary was perfect? The Bible says that Lucifer was perfect in the day that he was created. That when he moved, music would come from him. And he was perfect. And everything that he did until the Bible says iniquity was found. In other words, until the sanctuary was defiled. Because disobedience defiles the sanctuary. When Lucifer was puffed up, the Bible says, because of his beauty, look at me. Then he decided that, uh, well, the attention that we're giving to God should go to me. I mean, I'm up front. I'm the one leading the choir. I'm the one that's singing. Why should we be listening to him when should be looking at me? And the Bible says that this type of pride, he couldn't repent from. He had the opportunity to repent, but he didn't. And he actually became that which he thought in his heart to do. And the Bible says there was war in heaven. That's hard to put in the same sentence. War in heaven? But we know that this war was symbolic of Lucifer deciding that, well, we're not going to do it God's way. We're going to do it my way. And we had two great problems that occurred in heaven. Number one was the defiling of the sanctuary by Lucifer deciding that the attention would go to him. That's the first problem. Then there was another problem. Because not only did Lucifer sin against God, but he convinced one third of the angels to sin with him. One third. So we had problems. So he was cast out of heaven. And came to earth. And Adam and Eve were told in the garden an instruction by God. Because in the book of Genesis, the Bible says that there was a tree. And God made it clear in his instructions that this tree was not to be eaten from, the fruit of it, nor was it to be touched, or you would die. The least you die, that's what the Bible says in Genesis. So the Bible says God made it clear that a choice had to be made. In demonstration that salvation is a choice. Amen. We have to make a choice. And contrary to what some people are teaching and even preaching, by our opinions and assumptions, there are only two choices. There are only two. Because there's only two roads to go. Either we worship God with all our heart, soul, and mind, in obedience to his will, or we live by our own will. Yeah. That's the only two choices. And God in his infinite wisdom, with the entire universe focused on one particular incident that happened and happened, is saying, well, the accusations that Satan made, is they correct, or is he proven to be a liar? So the plan of salvation went into place. As soon as Adam and Eve sinned, the plan of salvation went into place. The first thing in the plan of salvation is the remission of sins, to be forgiven. Now we know that that happened at the cross. When Jesus Christ died on the cross, the remission of sin the forgiveness of sin was complete. He said it's finished. But then there's another thing that has to be done. The accusations that were made against God was to vindicate the character of God. 
We can't just simply ask for forgiveness of sin. We must demonstrate that the character of God is in us by having a complete overhaul of our hearts. Amen. That we may reflect His character. That we may show the entire universe that you can live a life in victory over sin. Amen. That we can live a life that will glorify God. We can do that. There are even people in the church that still to this day believe that you cannot live a life on this earth without sin. Imagine that. It can't be done. Isn't this what Lucifer said when he became Satan? That you cannot keep the commandments of God. That you cannot have the faith of Jesus. You can't do it. It's not possible. So we have no right to be in heaven. We have no right to be in the feet of the Father. This is the accusations of it. Well, God has said in his word that, oh, yes, we do. And how do we do it? Through the blood of Jesus. The testimony of Jesus. In the book of Revelation, in chapter number 14, in verse number 12, the Bible says, here is the patience of the saints. Here are they that keep what? The commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. So in order for us to have a completion in our minds and in our hearts of the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus, God said something very particular in the book of Exodus. Now let's set this up really quick. The children of Israel were just free from Egypt. And in the wilderness, when Moses came down from the mountain and God said to him, those that are choosing God, make me a tabernacle. Now here's a question I want to ask the church. The first question. What is the purpose of the tabernacle? What does the Bible say in Exodus chapter number 25? In verse 9. In verse 8, verse number 8, it says, Let them make me a sanctuary that I may what? That I may dwell among you. So the purpose of the sanctuary is what? So that God can dwell among us. That's the purpose of it. Now let me say this. If the purpose of the sanctuary is for God to dwell among us, then what is the purpose of the sanctuary today? It's the same thing. Exactly the same. That he may dwell among us. And remember what I said earlier, the sanctuary in earth is a replica of the sanctuary where? In heaven. What is it also a replica of the sanctuary that's in where? That's in your heart. It's a sanctuary. Then what does it say in verse number 9? It says, according to all that I've showed thee, after the pattern of the tabernacle, and the pattern of all the instruments thereof, even so shall ye make it. Now this is really, really important. Because when we're talking about the sanctuary, and we're talking about the presence of God, it was important that every single thing in the sanctuary be as according to God's instructions. What would happen in the sanctuary if something was not done in accordance with the will of God? We would defile the sanctuary. And what does it mean to defile the sanctuary? Could God's presence be in the sanctuary that's defiled? It cannot. 
So we have defeated the entire purpose of the sanctuary if we have defilement in the sanctuary. So this was why it was very important that things be done in accordance with the will of God. Is that any different today than it was then? No, it is not. So we cannot have defilement in the sanctuary. And so it's important when you're looking at the pattern of the tabernacle that we understand that everything in the tabernacle had something to do with our salvation. Everything. It has something to do with your relationship with God. Because in the Garden of Eden, before sin, what kind of relationship did Adam and Eve have with God? They had a close relationship. They had an intimate relationship. They had direct communication with God. The Bible says he walked with them in the cool of the day. It reminds me of, of uh, when I told you about uh, Dr. Bill. That was his name, Bill Kuzansky. He was a doctor. And, and just being with him and experience the way he handles things taught me many, many things about the Bible and about life. So I, I treasured the times that I spent with him. Now I'm not comparing Dr. Bill to God in any, way, in any way, but the anointing, the power of the Holy Spirit that came through him, the origin of that came from God. How do I know it? Because it's in harmony with the Word of God. This is how you know somebody really has an anointing. Their character is in harmony with Scripture. That's one of the ways. And that's what he had. And so this is what Adam and Eve had. They had where the character of God was, was flowing. It was peace. It was harmony. But that was disrupted. When they decided to be rebellious. When they were disobedient. So there was a separation. And when the separation happened, what did God do? He said, there, I have a plan. And the plan of salvation went into effect immediately. So when we're talking about our relationship with God, it is really important, just like then, just like now, that we have to reference the saints' prayer. Everything has to be done decently and orderly. Amen. Because if there's any disobedience in the arrangement, in our instructions, in our application, in our love one to the other, then God's presence can't be there. Because light and dark can't occupy the same space. The light exposes the darkness. So we're talking about the tabernacle. We're talking about the sanctuary. And so let's go over a little bit about what's in the sanctuary. The tabernacle that was made from, uh, designed by God to give it to Moses in the mountain. What is the first thing that you see when you come to the courtyard? Does anybody know? Or you can just read it. What's the first thing? The altar of what? Of the sacrifice. Okay? So, when they brought lambs and they brought animals for the sacrifice, who did that represent? It represented Jesus Christ. So if it represented Jesus Christ, and that's the lamb that was slain from the foundation of the world, how do we reference that today? How do we, in other words, here's a better question, how do we in church today defile the very nature of God and his sacrifice through Jesus Christ? How do we defile that? How do we be disobedient to that? In other words, we, we, we all quoted John 3, 16, right? For God so loved the world, He gave His only begotten Son, who so believeth in Him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. If Jesus Christ is the sacrifice, I'm going to tell you how, and even in the church today, that we defile that scripture. Here's the question. When Jesus Christ died, did He die for my sins, or did He die for everybody's sins? He died for everyone's sins. So if you come to the sanctuary and you ask for forgiveness for your sins, yet you have a problem with your brother's sin, then what have you just done? You defiled the sanctuary. Because you brought dirt 
into the church. See, if we're not willing to forgive, then how can you ask for forgiveness? Because if God sent His Son to die on the cross, He had to have died for everyone's sins. The ones that were against Him, the ones that were against you. So we honor that when we forgive our brothers and our sisters for anything that they've done against us. We can't be in the presence of God angry and upset at our brother or our sister because of what they've done. But we're asking God to forgive what we've done. Because remember about sin. How many sins did it take to defile the sanctuary? It only takes one. So who amongst us can stand at the altar and having never sinned at all? The Bible says who? No one. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Amen. So when you enter the court and you bring the sacrifice, it represents Jesus. We do that today in the church by being forgiving and forgiving our brothers and our sisters. Amen. And you honor the sacrifice that God has made for you. What's the second thing we see in the, uh, in the courtyard? The, the basin. What was inside the basin? It was water. What's the purpose of the water? It was for washing. What does the Bible say when it says, if you confess your sin, he is faithful to do what? To forgive us of our sins and cleanse us of all unrighteousness. So the, if the basin was the purpose of it was to cleanse us, what do we do today to come to the sanctuary cleansed? We pray and we what? And we fast. When we pray and fast, we're asking God to cleanse us. To come to the sanctuary with clean hands. To not bring agony, frustration, and all these sort of things that's going on in our life to the sanctuary. Now, I'm telling you what I did not say. I did not say that you don't come to the altar with your problems. I didn't say that you don't come to the sanctuary, they don't come in here unless you act like the world outside don't exist. That's not what I said. We exercise our faith by believing that whatever our problems are, we can lay at the foot of Jesus. Amen. Whatever it is. Some of us are facing some things that are, oh my goodness. It's pretty tough. It's not easy. Especially when these are people we love. We're not talking about strangers. That's a whole other sermon. How do I love my enemy? How do we love each other? We have to be able to come to the altar with clean hands. So we need to be clean. Creating me a clean heart and a right spirit within me. So that when we come into the inner court, which was the holy place. Remember, you can't enter there unclean. So if we have forgiven our brothers and sisters, if we have asked for forgiveness for our sins, if we have laid our bodies, the temple, at the foot of the cross and allowed Jesus Christ to cleanse us, now we enter into the holy place. Now, in the holy place, what was, I'm not going to get into what was on uh, the south and north, but if I come into the inner court, on the south side of the inner court, what did we have? The candlesticks. The candlesticks. What does the candlesticks represent? Light of the world, Holy Spirit. Okay. How many candlesticks were there? Well, it was actually only one candlestick, but it had seven candles. All right? And this was the only light that was in the sanctuary. What did the light represent? It represented Jesus Christ. I said all things in it represented Jesus Christ. So the light, the Bible says, let your light shine among men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. Ye are the salt of the earth. You are the light. We are the light. When somebody meets you, when somebody greets you, does the light of Christ shine through them? Amen. Do they see God when they see you? Do they hear Jesus Christ when you speak? Are you letting your light shine? 
Sometimes we act like there ain't no batteries in our flashlight. It may be a light, but if there's no batteries in it, then it's not shining. What good is it? Doing? We need to have oil in our lights. Don't be caught with no oil in your light. That's one of the reasons we come to church. It's one of the reasons we pray for each other. We strengthen each other. We make sure that you, you got oil in your life so that when you do meet somebody and they can see the light of Christ in you, it draws them where? Right to the altar. What was on the north side of the sanctuary? Of the tabernacle? It was, it was the table of showbread. One for each of the twelve tribes of Israel. This bread was to be kept fresh every day. What did that bread signify? Word of God. What is the bread? Word. It's the word. It's the word of God. How do you be familiar with this? What is 2 Timothy 2.15? Study the what? To show thyself approved. A working man. You need not be ashamed. Rightly dividing the word of truth. This is important because the bread had to be kept fresh every day. So when should, how often should we die to self? Daily. daily. Die to self daily. We should be in God's word every day. Because we know Satan don't take days off. He don't say, well, because it's Tuesday, and I know this is your uh, uh, closing day, and you go to the laundromat today, I'm not going to bother you today. Die to self daily. We need to be daily in our word. Now, what was the another thing, the last thing that was in the uh, that was in the in the tabernacle? The altar of in the front of the sanctuary is the uh, the altar of incense. This is where the blood would be sprinkled when. The priest came in to uh, for your uh, the remission of your sins, and so what did we ask that we do at the altar? What did you say we, we burn? What we burn incense? What did that signify? It signified the prayers, and the prayers is the righteousness of Christ. What that means is that we should have daily prayer. The Bible says pray without what? Ceasing. Without ceasing. What kind of prayer life do you have? There are people who the only time they're praying is when they're in church or they're getting ready to eat something. That's the only time you hear them pray. I've known people the only time they pray is on Easter. Which is not a relationship with God. If you enter the sanctuary and we are not in the spirit of prayer, then what have we just done to the sanctuary? Wow. We have defiled it. And if your sanctuary is defiled, is God's presence there? It can't be. The purity of prayer and the fervency of prayer is everything to God. Because it is acknowledging who He is and who He is in you. See, it's one thing to believe that God can do anything. Raise your hand if you think God can do anything. There's nothing God can't do. Amen. Now here's another question. Can God do anything through you? Where is our faith? Because if we increase our faith, the Bible says if we have the faith of a mustard seed, we can say to this mountain, be ye cast in the sea, and it will obey you. How do you explain that to a person that doesn't know God? You know, it was something that when the uh, young lady was talking and she quoted the scripture and she was talking about her family. In the book of Acts, in chapter 16, the Bible says, believe in the, on the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved in your household as well. That's what the Bible says. And we're talking about the, the sanctity of the sanctuary. And when you think about, if I really believe that, 
and I come to the altar with clean hands. And the Bible says the effectual fervent prayer of the righteous veil of much. Then the words that Jesus spoke is coming out of your mouth, then the results should glorify God. Is God glorified if I'm in agony and pain? Is God glorified?